Okay. Good morning. The last few people just arrived. Before we start, um, I would like to take just one second and uh, take a photo for uh, our workplace uh, so the, they see that we actually held a talk here and not only made holidays in Amsterdam. <laughs> so if you're fine with it, I would just like to take a quick photo. Yeah, that's already it. Okay. <laughs> Now to the fun part. Uh, good morning, I already said that. Um, hope you slept well, but I see a few cups of coffee already, so there's that. Um, we're happy to see you here, so many people, even though it's the first talk of the day early in the morning and you had to walk um, all these stairs uh, up to the attic. Uh, I've counted, it's uh, more than 100 stairs. <laughs> Thanks for that. And as you might have guessed, today we are going to talk about uh, how to convert your Blender file or 3D scene uh, to a Gaussian Splat uh, or Nerf file. And both have been a hyped up topic for the past uh, one or two years. Nerfs uh, rather came up last year and Gaussian Splatting end of last year um, more relevant this year. And therefore we created a Blender add-on uh, which uh, creates uh, data sets for um, your 3D scenes uh, which can then be used to create a Gaussian Splatting or Nerf file. So First of all, let's talk about why we would even uh, want our Blender scenes as a Gaussian split or radiance field. I mean, um, why don't we just export them the uh, normal way and upload them to Sketchfab or any other 3D online viewer? And you might uh, know the struggle. If you want to export your Blender file um, and keep all the beautiful lights and shadows you spend hours on uh, creating, and maybe even the reflections on reflecting surfaces, uh, you have to bake them um, in often multiple texture sets or light maps. And yeah, for large scenes, this can get uh, quite confusing. And when it comes, uh, comes to reflecting surfaces or glass or semi-transparent uh, materials, um, depending on the viewer you use, the results can look quite different from what you create in, in uh, cycles. And yeah, you end up with a lot of files uh, that possibly also look different than you intended to. And you have to spend even more time on it. So for another scenario, large scale scenes, for example, you um, build a forest or a whole city or whatever you're working on. Um, to display these uh, in real time, you would have to um, decimate these millions of triangles or retopologize. And that also means creating new UV maps. And yeah, also the whole um, a scene is dependent on what texture resolution you use. And with Gaussian splits and nerves on the other hand, they don't rely on uh, textures, or UV maps or even triangles. This eliminates um, all the annoying stuff I mentioned before. And we can view our models even for large scale scenes with, for example, particle systems or hair, which doesn't work that good, um, even on mobile devices on the web. And yeah, this also comes with some downsides, which we will talk about in the talk. But yeah, let's get started. Um, and before we jump into the technical aspect, let's introduce ourselves. Uh, we are Svenja Strobel from the FAU, and I'm Colin Behrens uh, from the Creative Institute in uh, Ostwestfalia. And we both work on our master thesis right now um, regarding Gaussian splits. And maybe Svenja wanted to say one or two sentences about herself. Yes, good morning everyone, also from my side. As Colin already mentioned, my name is Svenja Strobel. I'm currently studying for my computer science master degree at the FAU University in Erlangen. My master thesis is in the range of Gaussian splatting. What I'm trying to do is to improve the quality of LiDAR point clouds by kind of marrying LiDAR together with Gaussian splatting. And um, just a short note, I'll be done with my master's thesis in January next year, and after that I'll be looking for a full-time job in the computer vision industry. So in case anyone knows someone who needs an expert on Gaussian splatting neural radiance fields or photogrammetry next year, you can find me on LinkedIn then. <laughs> okay, great. So, but before we uh, started with our master's and studies, um, yeah, we are both three artists, so more on the creative side. We started quite early in about uh, 2014, so 10 years ago. Um, but besides that, we also uh, publish add-ons, uh, asset packs, and shaders under the name uh, Vertex Wizards. And 
yeah, we do this since 2018. We are not that big of a player in the Blender add-ons industry, but maybe you've heard of us, maybe not. Um, but we were able to gain a lot of experience with photogrammetry. And yeah, this led us uh, to working with um, Gaussian splitting and NERS because they are both related. And now we jump into the more uh, technical aspect of the talk and Svenja will, yeah, do this. Yes, so now I'll walk you through most of the technical part of this presentation. So first of all, nerves and Gaussian splatting. Here's the short introduction slide, Halloween theme, because Halloween is coming up. This slide is basically just supposed to show you why nerves and Gaussian splats are so, have been so hyped up for the past couple of years. Here you can just see the comparison between one of our photo scan models rendered in Blender versus the equivalent in Gaussian splatting and in um, instant NGP. And we can just see that the reconstruction quality is just really that good and it trains quite quickly. And the fact that you can actually train this is why people are so excited to have these methods because you can con also convert real world scenes into basically their equivalent in the digital world without having to model anything and that's why people are so excited about this. So first of all, let's get started now into the newer, how the newer method works of these two Gaussian splatting, because you'll need to know some basics in nerves and Gaussian splats to understand what our add-on actually does later on. So traditionally in computer graphics, we have our beloved triangles, and from the, these triangles, we create meshes, which we can then render out to create beautiful images. In Gaussian splatting, the idea is a bit different. Here we replace our triangles with 3D Gaussians. Sounds complicated, but basically it's just a blob. And then we position these blobs strategically in 3D space, such that the blobs blended together in rendering then look equivalent to a very complex scene with millions of triangles. But we have the fact that we can train this on input data. So now how does Gaussian splatting actually work? First of all, we need some input. So we would go around just as with photogrammetry, take a few hundred photos of whatever we want to create a Gaussian splat out of, and then first of all, send it to the structure for motion algorithm. The structure for motion algorithm just gives us basically two things. It gives us the camera alignments, so it tells us how were the cameras positioned in 3D space, and it also gives us a sparse point cloud, which gives us an idea of what our scene actually looked like in the real world. Now these inputs, so the point cloud, the camera alignments, and the input images are given to Gaussian splatting to start the training. And then the initial set of Gaussians is initialized simply at the positions of these 3D points. Then the training iteration kind of begins. So in each iteration, we randomly choose one of these training images. We rasterize out our Gaussians from the camera view of this image. And then in the beginning, we get a pretty bad looking blurry image. But we can use that then to compare it to the training image and calculate a loss. Then we can back propagate the loss to the Gaussians and iteratively update their parameters, such as their colors, their positions, their opacities, etc., to make them look more and more like a nice pumpkin. Now, there's one additional part of this pipeline which is rather important, and that's the adaptive density control. It basically just solves the problem of us having a few thousand input points from structure for motion, but us needing a few million Gaussians to create a realistic looking image. So it basically just adds more Gaussians where we need more details and removes Gaussians where we don't. Now, this already kind of creates cool looking scenes, but Gaussian splatting does a few more tricks to create this, these realistic looking images. The first trick is that um, they have this Gaussian opacity gradient in the blobs. That's why they're called 3D Gaussians. And these make it a lot easier to actually blend the Gaussians together using alpha blending and not have any sharp borders or anything. And the second trick, which lets Gaussian splatting recreate effects such as reflections or refractions, is that they don't only assign a color to each Gaussian, but they use spherical harmonics. So spherical harmonics it sounds complicated, but basically what this just stores is that with color, we would simply reflect back the same color into each direction of light that is bounced off of the Gaussian. In spherical harmonics, basically we store which color is reflected back into which direction. So then we could, for each Gaussian, say maybe it reflects back blue to the front and red to the back. And with this trick, we can create effects such as glass or reflections using Gaussian splats. So now let's move uh, here. You can see, by the way, the comparison between going from Gaussians using no 
opacity gradients or spherical harmonics to the scene using the actual alpha blending and the spherical harmonics. And we can kind of see the comparison here that the scene here on the left looks a lot smoother and more realistic than the scene on the right. Now, Your right side. my right yeah. side, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> this image, <laughs> this image uses spherical harmonics and alpha blending, this doesn't. So now, now it should be clear. Okay. Now let's move on to the other method, neural radiance fields. While neural radiance fields and Gaussians are often talked about together, they're actually very different. Gaussian splatting is very similar to traditional computer graphics. Neural radiance fields is, works more on the AI-based ba side. So with neural radiance fields, we store our 3D scene using a neural network, which learns a special five-dimensional function. It sounds complicated, but I'll try to explain it in a bit, a bit easier fashion with this pipeline image here. So for nerves, we need the kind of similar inputs as for Gaussian splatting. We take our images, we put them into structure for motion, we get our camera alignments. Then we also kind of know the, the scale of our 3D scene, which we can use to initialize a volume. This volume is now what is stored with the neural network. The 5D function it learns is that it can tell us at each point in this volume, which light is reflect, uh, which color and which density is reflected back in each ray direction. And using this now, we can do volume rendering. So in the training loop, we once again, in each iteration, we randomly choose one camera view for which we render the volume, and now we use rest, uh, ray tracing. So through each pixel, we shoot a ray and then step through the volume. And at each point where we step through the volume, we ask the neural network which color and which density are reflected back to our camera. And then using this, these answers from the neural network, we can construct an image and compare it once again to our training image, calculate the loss, and backpropagate it to update the weights of the neural network. And then after a few thousand iterations, it gets better and better, and we end up with a realistic looking pumpkin again. So now neural radiance fields and Gaussian splats are not talked about together without any reason. They have a lot of similarities as well. So both need training. That's the annoying part. It takes a while. In the beginning, neural radiance fields trained for days. It was not that great, but now they train in a few minutes, so they're more usable now. The only downside still is that the training is very memory intensive. So that's why we'll not be able to show you a live demo of the training process on this laptop later on, because we would need a lot of GPU memory to actually train our scenes. But after the training process, we are rewarded with quite a few nice properties. We have very nice realistic results, which we can also render in real time, depending on which framework we use. And we end up with small files, especially for neural radiance fields. These files are quite small because all that is stored in them are the weights of the neural network and not any millions of triangles, textures, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So now, to sum up, the most important part you should take away from this technical introduction is what we need for our add-on, and that is to remind you of what the input for nerves and Gaussian splatting was. And that was the structure for motion output, which is for nerves only the calibrated camera positions, and the input images, and for Gaussian splatting, additionally, these, the sparse point cloud from the structure for motion. Because what our add-on now actually wants to do is to not take just images from our 3D scene and blender and plug them into structure for motion, but to replace the structure for motion algorithm entirely and directly get this information out of blender and get a lot better input for the algorithms to create better results. But more about that now from Colin. Okay. So um, as Svenja mentioned, we could just take um, renderings from our scene. For example, we could create a camera path uh, around an object we have in our scene and uh, plug them into PostShot or any other Gaussian splatting framework, and it would be quite easily. Um, it would, yeah, it would work. Um, but the results um, are way better when we entirely replace the first step, the structure from motion algorithm, because we already have perfect camera position in our 3D scene. We know where each camera is, and also. Um, yeah, this results in that we need uh, less photos in general because that doesn't have to be that big of an overlap. 
uh, for the reconstruction and we get lower training times, um, better alignments, uh, less uh, reconstruction errors and it even works in a plain white scene. So if you would uh, take a Gaussian splitting of this room, the plain white walls would uh, make some problems as they don't have a lot of features in it. But um, yeah, it uh, doesn't matter with our add-on um, because everything is already known by the camera and uh, the initial point clouds. So if you now want to start from scratch and uh, convert your Blender file into a Gaussian splitting on Nerf, um, you would have to first um, yeah, follow this workflow. Um, in the beginning, you would have to build um, a framework, for example, the um, original framework uh, 3D Gaussian splitting. Um, <laughs> um, just for notice, I don't ha really have an IT background and uh, building the framework from GitHub can get quite uh, confusing and annoying. There are installation instructions. Um, but the first time I did it, it took me like one or two days. Uh, I, I nearly cried and I had to ask for help um, because it was throwing errors all around like uh, couldn't install submodule and those of you who, are, who already tried this might know it or mismatching version of CUDA, Python, PyTorch, I don't know. Um, so this is the hard part, um, but I'm sure you can get it done. Been, and the next few um, parts uh, will be covered by our add-on. So that's, uh, yeah. So about the first part, camera placement. Um, we will automatically place, uh, strategi strategically place the cameras in our 3D scene. Um, but we will also create a point cloud um, from the scene, which we need as initializing uh, points uh, which would otherwise be created by the structure from motion algorithm. Uh, then we need the rendering. Um, Blender can do this quite easily just by hit rendering animation. And uh, last, you just uh, have a folder with um, images, uh, camera alignments, and a point cloud, and you just need to plug it into your uh, favorite uh, 3D Gaussian splitting framework and start the training. But um, now let's talk about these steps a bit more in detail because in the end you're here to learn and uh, yeah, otherwise you could just download our add-on and have fun. So let's start in the very beginning, um, placing cameras in the real world because we need to know how we should place the cameras in the digital world. So what is important for photogrammetry or any other scanning software that relies on the structure from motion algorithm? Um, we need to pay attention to a few things. Um, First of all, if you take real photos in the real world, we have a changing environment. This means uh, if you scan outdoor, people can walk through your image, and the sun is, moves and, uh, is moving and so are the shadows. Um, also, you could like, if you scan this room, bump uh, into a chair and misplace it and it would mess up the whole algorithm. And also, we don't know where exactly we did uh, take the image from. so it would have to be calculated. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned earlier, this results in a lot of photos uh, that needs to be taken because we need an overlap of about 60 to 80% between each, each image. And we also don't, uh, yeah, we shouldn't forget the uh, parts like the ceiling and the bottom or below chairs. These are often forgotten when we scan outside or yes. And one last important thing, it's not a good idea to just um, grab your uh, phone and start taking photos uh, in automatic mode because we need constant exposure in every image. So um, you should grab a camera which you can uh, set to manual settings and uh, have like um, uh, aperture as closed as possible to avoid blurriness in the autofocus areas uh, and ISO quite low. Um, it's not exactly the same as the noise you know from cycles, but both will mess up the uh, reconstruction. And uh, the exposure time, so you don't blur the image when shooting out of hand. Um, of course, a good camera will help with all these steps, but uh, a good camera is expensive. So just unlike our software uh, Blender, which is free, um, and it has, does have another few positive impacts as well because luckily rendered images are much cleaner than real photos. 
And as long as you don't enable it, there is no uh, depth of field, there is no motion blur, you can render as long as you wish to, uh, to eliminate all noise. Lights don't move if you don't want. And yeah, this uh, are, uh, is a perfect starting point um, for Gaussian splitting or photogrammetry. And Sven, uh, Svenja will continue a bit more about the algorithm which plays at the cameras. Yes, exactly. So virtual environment, amazing. Everything is constant. We also know where the cameras are. We know where the objects are. So we can easily get started automating the camera placement. So in general, we always, in the real world and in the digital world, have kind of two capture cases. We have the case where we have one central object, like a statue or a character, which is in the center, which we then want to capture from all sides. That is the easy case. And we have the case where we have a more open scene without any central focus, such as a room or a large outdoor environment, where the automatic, uh, the automatic camera placement is a lot more difficult. But let's get started with the easy part. Just having a central character or thing in the middle. This is a quite solved problem. What you want to do in general is you want to uniformly place cameras at even distances regarding this object in the real world and in the digital world. So the most simple thing you can do is you can take the top hemisphere of a sphere, uniformly place cameras there, and then plop the sphere over the object. This is the most easy to implement, but it's not that ideal because the, unif the distances aren't really uniform regarding the object. So what our, uh, what our add-on is actually doing is that it places more of the sphere over the object in comparison to where its center actually is. This way, we get a lot more even distances to the object, and this drastically improves the results. I did a master's project last year about how this impacts the results of photogrammetry and null radiance fields, and the resulting quality is really significantly better just doing this simple trick in these cases. It could, of course, be a lot more complex, but this runs very quickly, so good method for our add-on. Now let's move on to the more complicated case, the open scenes. Our goal here once again is that we want to place the cameras evenly throughout our scene and try to capture everything so we don't miss out any things like the ceiling or the bottom. So what our add-on does, first of all, it figures out where is the bounding box of our scene and then tries to place the cameras uniformly throughout this bounding box and at each position looks in multiple different directions. We also have to check that we're, because in the virtual world, we can accidentally place cameras inside the objects. So we have to make sure that we don't do this by checking if we are inside an object before placing it there and relocating it in case. Also, what we want to avoid is kind of useless images where, we li where we're like 10 centimeters in front of a wall and see just white. Not really that great. So our add-on also tests for these cases and if they occur, it rotates the camera away from the wall or whatever it's facing. While this works, it works a lot better than it did in the beginning, it was so bad. But it's still probably the most buggy part of our add-on because it's just difficult to generalize this for all sorts of scenes that can occur. But if you're working with our add-on and trying it out, and this, the results are kind of mediocre at first, play around with the parameters, maybe manually re-keyframe some of the cameras, but it should work decently well. Yes. Okay, now that we have created all our camera positions, we need to somehow save these uh, camera positions and information in general about the camera and make them understandable for Gaussian splitting or nerves. And otherwise it would have to use a structure from motion algorithm, which we want to avoid. So, um, yeah, on the right side, you can see an uh, example of how um, our file that stores all the camera information uh, looks like. It contains uh, the following elements and I want to say briefly just a few words about what is even saved there. Um, first of all, uh, the axis aligned bounding box, it's, uh, it describes the scale of the scene and is needed for the frameworks to initialize uh, the training. Uh, then we have the resolution, so width and height, so uh, default is 1000 by 1000 pixels with this add-on. Uh, and also we have the focal length and the field of view. Um, they describe the same thing, but different frameworks need uh, either the uh, focal length or the field of view, so both are written into it. 
And then we maybe have the most important part, the camera transform matrix. It's uh, the um, location and rotation of the camera. So where exactly it was when uh, the rendering was taken. It's uh, the long part you see. And in the end, we just have the file pass uh, to the image, uh, the information above described, because we have to store this information for uh, every image uh, we take. So um, yeah, this can get uh, to a quite long file, but we will see this later. Next, after we've uh, created all the renderings, um, the next important step is the point cloud creation. We tried two different approaches. Uh, the first one was to just subdivide our geometry until a certain density of vertices per um, surface area was reached. And yeah, it had some advantages, but uh, we also tried to use geometry nodes to generate point cloud. Um, yeah. So the first approach, the subdivision approach, it worked quite well when we had a really simple topology, perfect topology. But as we encountered more special cases like uh, n-gons or uneven density, um, particles or any other form of object that is not a mesh like uh, curves or metaballs, um, the results got worse or even crashed. So the only advantage uh, this technique had is that we could easily bake the colors into the vertex colors. Um, but we yeah, discarded this approach because uh, there were too many errors and we um, continued with another approach for uh, placing the particles with geometry nodes. Yes, after our subdivision approach was way too slow and buggy, we, after some trial and error, thank God we found a geometry node setup which solved all of our problems. It gives us uniformly, uniform density point clouds and we can also input the desired density we want, which is just exactly what we want. We can then apply a very simple geometry node setup which just contains of the geometry node distribute points on faces and then converting the points to the vertices. We can apply this to all objects in the scene and then we have our point cloud. So it's actually very easy, but it took a while to find that this actually exists. Okay, now we have the point cloud, the renderings and also the camera alignments and now we can get to the more fun part. Uh, no more technique, we want to show you some demos, uh, some pre-recorded and some live here on stage. Um, we will start with uh, this pre-recorded uh, demo which shows you how to install the add-on and how it works with a more complex scene, an indoor kitchen which we created a few years ago. Exactly. As with all things, first of all, we begin with installing our add-on from the zip file. It is very easy. Next, yeah, very easy. So next, we simply have to, first of all, choose an output directory where all of our files will be stored. And then we have to get started drawing our bounding box. Because sometimes we don't want to include all objects for the scene for our actual point cloud creation. So here we want to make sure that the bounding box really only encompasses the relevant part of the scene, in this case, the room, because it will be where the cameras are actually placed and the light plane outside, we don't care about that. So after kind of making this fit very well, we now simply check that how many cameras we want, in this case 200, and simply create the cameras for the indoor scene, and then create some keyframes for our camera, which then lets you render it out easily as an animation. Here you should probably check if the cameras it created make sense, or if it, for some buggy reason, it did end up putting it inside something where you don't want it. But here we can now see that all camera frames look like they're, like they make sense, have even distances towards the walls and stuff. And then we move on to the next part and that is creating the point cloud. So we set a density that makes sense, in this case 4,000. You want to aim for around a few hundred thousand to a million points in this point cloud for exporting for the best possible results with Gaussian splatting. And then here we simply wait for a few seconds because it has to apply this geometry node setup to all of our objects in the scene. And before that it has to apply modifiers, particle systems, and then revert everything back after creating the point cloud because we don't want to break the scenes. So we can see here now that it applied the point cloud geometry node system to all of our objects in the scene. 
this point cloud has also already been exported. It's just displayed. So you yeah, see that it actually did something. Next, we here set the rendering settings automatically, like the output directory and the resolution. And then as the last part, we simply export the files. Now we see here in our output directory that we have everything we need. We have our image folder, our points cloud that we just created, as well as the transform train.json and the transform test.json file. These are the files that we talked about previously that just contain these camera intrinsic and extrinsic information. So what is the focal length? Where were the cameras positioned? Where are the image files? Or where will they, they be written to in a moment when we actually start the rendering process? And here we can now see that this file is rather lengthy for 200 frames. The transforms test.json is also written out. It's more for research purposes and some frameworks require them for legacy reasons because they had to verify that their systems work and did not update their code to not need the transforms test.json. And then we simply hit render animation and it will render out all of the keyframes of our camera to the same image file paths that were specified in this transforms train.json file. Our add-on has the standard value of using 20 seconds for each frame using denoising, which ends up with about a render time of one hour for 200 frames, but you could also go for less. It's not that important if these images are perfect or blurry because Gaussian splatting looks kind of blurry anyway, and also going for higher resolutions than 1,000 times 1,000 pixels does not improve the results of Gaussian splatting. It only makes it slower or even breaks the results if you end up running out of GPU memory. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now to see the finished result on the left side, you can see a time lapse of how the training process looks like. Um, this took about uh, 30 minutes. You see on uh, the wall, for example, so rather simple geometry, this gets reconstructed uh, quite easily. While the chairs, for example, with uh, thin geometry parts that uh, take a lot more iterations until they look good. Um, yeah. So this is uh, the training process. And on the right side now, we have a video um, going a bit more in detail why this Gaussian split looks so good. For example, with photogrammetry, we uh, wouldn't be able to reconstruct thin parts like the cables, uh, the lamps are attached to, and also the reflections you see in the glass of the um, light bulbs. Uh, this would just break with photogrammetry. And now we have our 3D scene, um, are able to view it in real time. Uh, even on mobile devices uh, with our cycles quality, so with reflections and light and everything baked in, and it's just one single file, so we don't have to struggle with uh, a directory full of uh, texture sets. But as I mentioned earlier, we not only have this uh, pre-recorded um, demo, we also have a live uh, on-stage demo. Uh, it worked until now. Let's uh, see if it still works. You know the struggle when presenting and you want to shout something, it will just break. Okay, so here we have our add-on and uh, test scene uh, that we created. It's an object-centric approach. Um, first of all, we've set the output path. Uh, path. Um, we can set a custom focal length, otherwise uh, the add-on will calculate one automatically that fits the scene. And if you want to export a nerve, you can optimize for instant NGP, so the data set export uh, will match that, uh, that is required for NERV. Then we have the point cloud density. We will just leave it to 2000 at the moment because we are uh, working on laptop here. Frame count is 200, which is fine for the demo as well. The resolution, we will just leave this is, uh, at the standard values. Um, then we have the minimum camera distance um, that the camera uh, is placed away from objects. And the next few uh, Values are not that important for the object-centric approach. They are for the large-scale or indoor approach. Um, this is like the tilt angle of the cameras or when it is rotated away from, um, from an object. And yeah, first of all, let's draw the bounding box. Uh, it will suggest the size based on the scene. Uh, we can also scale this up or down if we want to, but we just leave it as it is. And then uh, we create and export our point cloud quite fast. Here's the point cloud. And then we only need to prepare render settings where copy our, uh, copy our values we set like the resolution to the file. So um, we will just 
prepare render settings, you see, for example, the output path changed, and now we can export our camera files. Great. <laughs> you, you forgot to, to create the cameras. Oh, great. <laughs> okay, let's create the cameras first. So here are the cameras. These are placed evenly around the object. Uh, now, if you want to export the camera files, yeah, now it worked, great, my fault. Um, yeah, and you will see the result uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, because let's continue with... the talk, okay. Um, we talked a lot about Gaussian splitting, uh, but here's an example of a nerf. Um, again, the pumpkin. Um, what is impressive is that the nerf trained in about one minute, or even less than one minute, with uh, instant NGP. Um, and all the reflections are in there, it looks great. It looks a bit more noisy than uh, Gaussian splitting, but yeah, if you prefer nerf, uh, the results are also very good. And yeah, Svenja will continue. Yes, so in case now you've gotten excited as well about nerves and Gaussian splatting, here are some tips for some frameworks you could get started with. So traditionally, you could, of course, get started with the traditional 3D Gaussian splatting framework. There are a lot of more user-friendly methods to use this now, such as post shots, some apps, etc. No going through GitHub anymore for that, in case you want to. Then. But if you want a bit more better quality, you could also try out the 2D Gaussian splatting method. It's a newer method from SIGGRAPH this year. And in my opinion, it creates a bit better results in terms of quality, especially if you have synthetic data sets. If your use case is that you have huge scenes that can't be reasonably trained in one iteration with Gaussian splatting, you could check out hierarchical Gaussian splatting, which then smartly chunks up your scenes into multiple training sets and then combines everything together at the end again. Hierarchical Gaussian splatting, bit difficult to build though, but if that's your use case, you could go with that. And if you want to get started with neural radiance fields, I can advise using instant NGP because it's also probably the most user-friendly method and fastest method you could use because it has pre-built binaries and you don't have to go through manually installing it through GitHub as well. And it trains super fast. So now our add-on does work at the moment. It's pretty efficient. It works pretty well for most cases, but there are still some things we could do better in the future. First of all, it would be really nice if we could go back to including the vertex colors in reasonable runtime because it improves the training speed significantly because going from like, because initially without the vertex colors, everything is just black. And if you maybe have an inner scene with lots of white walls, it'll take a while for all of those black Gaussians to get to white. While with vertex colors, we could just initialize them to be white and it would take maybe half the time in training. Then also our indoor camera placement could be a bit more robust. It works for most cases we tested it with, but there are complicated scenes out there. So we don't have that complicated scenes on our machines at the moment. So we could also make this more robust by just testing a bit more and then adjusting as needed. And also the point cloud creation process can take a while for huge scenes where you have large particle system setups and just multiple mo stacks of modifiers and geometry nodes. So there would also be room for improving the runtime there. Okay, um, now to the vision. So what um, we think uh, the add-on can be used for. So besides uh, sharing your scene online, which is a great case, if you want to share the character that you could uh, that you've created. Um, it could be also useful, for example, if you do something like uh, designing a kitchen in 3D for a customer. You not only could give them uh, renderings or maybe a video, um, you could give them a link to a Gaussian Splat or Nerf and they could see um, their product, uh, the kitchen, uh, interactive in 3D from all sides with great lighting, uh, reflecting surfaces and so on. And uh, this is a very specific case, but I guess it's, uh, it translates to a lot of different fields of work. And another topic is if you are an academic researcher, um, with this add-on you can create uh, synthetic data sets for research very fast and efficiently. And another last practical approach is if, if you, for example, create add-ons or assets uh, for Blender, 3D scans, I don't know. Um, 
you could display them uh, online, um, yeah, in all their quality. Or also the next IKEA shelf uh, that wouldn't look so flat uh, as it does right now with WebGL lighting. It uh, could look good. So um, feel free to scan uh, the QR code to see uh, the crystal tree we just created in our live demo. And um, it, we tested it out with the um, conference Wi-Fi. It should load about five seconds unless everyone does it at the same time. So. <laughs> Uh, the whole file is about, I guess, 15 megabytes in size, so it should l load quite fast. Um, yeah, so I see the most phones are already down again. So we, one more. So we can uh, continue with the important part of uh, the talk, where to get the add-on. First of all, the add-on is free. Um, that's the good news, uh, and we worked quite some time on it. Uh, but can't uh, guarantee that there will be no bugs and also uh, as we don't make any money from it and also writing our master thesis, we can't guarantee a lot of support. Um, but yeah, if you like the add-on, we would really enjoy a positive review and if you found a bug, just write us a message and we will try to get to it as uh, soon as possible. Um, at the moment, is a, it is available on Blender Market, and yesterday evening we updated for the new uh, extensions. So this should work as well. Um, yeah. And one last uh, slide. Uh, what would be a presentation without a last special thanks to uh, slide? So at this point, thanks to the Creative Institute uh, where I work at because uh, they sponsored this uh, trip to Amsterdam. And uh, one or two more sentences about the institute. It's a research institute in Germany. It's government funded and it's consisting of uh, three universities, the University of Paderborn, the uh, University of Applied Sciences and Art, uh, Ostwestfalia, and uh, a university for music and uh, sound, the uh, Hochschule für Musik. Uh, I don't think they have an English name. And yeah, if you're from Germany and working with VR, XR, interactive media, Gaussian splitting, whatever, and you might want to uh, work together on a research topic, uh, check out our website or talk to me later. And uh, I think we can, uh, yeah, make it work. So at this point, thank you very much for listening to us. And I think we have about seven more minutes if there are any questions. Uh, uh, do you want to capture the location indoor or outdoor? Uh, indoor. For indoor. Sure. Um, yeah. uh, with consumer friendly uh, equipment, I would uh, take a camera and if you can afford it, uh, the same way as photogrammetry. Um, you could also like stitch together a few more cameras uh, and uh, take photos at the same time, but you will have to run all these photos uh, through the default uh, call map process to create a structure from motion. Um, data, uh, yeah. So we do this uh, as freelance work, but uh, we also wanted to digitalize uh, and uh, convert our scenes to a split. But yes, uh, it's quite possible and the most easy uh, step to start with is just taking photos and uh, plug them into PostShot. They have a graphical user interface. It's really just drag and drop uh, photos and it will train depending on your machine in a few minutes to a few hours. It depends on if you'd run out of memory. Um, uh, do you mean the image overlap, uh, 60 to 80 percent I mentioned or, yeah. and uh, how it's measured or what do you think? Oh, um, for example, if I want to take a, a photo of this room and start with this, um, uh, beamer image, uh, I would take a photo from here to here and then, uh, would make sure that the next photo is at least 60 to 80 percent, the same content as the last photo. So I would take the photo from here to like here, so that 60 to 80 percent uh, of the new photo is still in the last photo because the algorithm needs it to align these images. 
Uh, yes? I didn't use Meshroom that much, but I think it should be possible. At, in the end, it's the same input data, correct? Yes, so for Gaussian splatting in general, there are, for most frameworks, you can always use some sort of synthetic data set. So you, if you have a point cloud as, as an input or you know your camera transformations, if they come from Blender or somewhere else, you can always kind of plug them into the framework. So I use work with LiDAR data for my master thesis. I also plug in all of the LiDAR um, the LiDAR data to start Gaussian splatting what, by going through this process of using the point clouds and the transform JSON files. So it should probably also work. You may just have to manually write some code to, uh, if you have camera transformations, to convert them to the correct format. But the point cloud, it should be usable, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's researchers, they, they have stuff to do. They often don't really continue updating their frameworks. But as there is so much research and development going on, probably someone, someone will get to that eventually. <laughs> yes. So when you have uh, reflective surfaces, then you get different things on the surface depending on your viewpoint. And it sounded like the spherical harmonics might solve that. Is there some kind of trade-off between like, how many angles you're looking at? So the spherical harmonics, depending on how much memory you have, you can kind of select how, how deep you want to go into the spherical harmonics. So the first kind of hierarchy level of spherical harmonics is just color. Same color in each direction. Then the next one you have, I think, three different colors for three different directions, and then nine, and then it goes exponentially into more directions. So the standard value used for spherical harmonics, I think, is um, hierarchy level three, so I think nine directions with different colors are um, trained in Gaussian splatting, but you can go deeper, and the deeper you go, the more crisp the refractions and reflections become, but the more memory you need. Yes? Yes. Could you describe your approach with volumes? Um, <clears throat> so, for example, if you have a, uh, a, I don't know, a simulated cloud from uh, Super like Houdini that you can uh, import as a PDD into Blender and then uh, um, like export it with a transparent background, so you have, uh, so you have the cloud as a uh, volume that has a Gaussian flat or something? So, we haven't tried, so our add on does not support volumes by default, but if you, you just have to get a point cloud somehow out of that volume. So you could probably go ahead and just create an emission particle system inside your volume and then get some points and then render it out. Well, just create the cameras, render out the camera positions and the frames, and then plug that into Gaussian splatting. So it should also work, but our um, add-on does not support that so far. Yes. It's, it's GPU memory, yeah. It, it can use a lot. <laughs> so so I've, I've run out of memory with, the, with our cluster with 80 gigabytes of GPU memory, so it, it, depending on what you're training, it can, it can go out. Yes, in the back. It should, all, it should also work. What it just does, it just it, it basically trains for what you're giving it. So if that's a cartoon scene or a real scene, it doesn't matter. It just takes the input images and then trains the Gaussians on that. So it will look exactly like what you plugged in for training. It should work with cartoon um, files as well. Yes? Uh, I was wondering if it's possible to realize the scenes from the 
So I'm not that deep into the relighting part of the Gaussian splatting research. I don't know if it's currently possible, but with as much research as going on, it will probably soon be possible somehow, or do you know? Uh, yes. Um... <laughs> It is possible, but it's, uh, it is a workaround. Uh, there are add-ons, for example, for Unreal Engine, but they create a copy of uh, the splat and create a mesh out of it and use this to catch the lighting and bake it uh, onto the splat again. So in the background, there's still a mesh generated from splat, uh, as far as I know. It's not perfect, but it works. Uh, it's a bit... Uh, yeah, uh, you need a lot of calculating power to make it run in real time in uh, Unreal. And the add-ons aren't perfect yet, but it works. Yes? Uh, but the answer to the to the, to the is it possible mm -hmm. to do like the short answer is no. The long answer is it's an active theory of research and various people are trying to make that possible with various degrees of success. But it's a hard problem because Yes, just with workarounds, so, but not real relighting of the split itself. At least not yet. Okay, and uh, I think one last question. We are running out of time. Yes? I'm not sure if it's a redundant question, but uh, would it work if you like, displace some of these faults? Uh, do you mean if you would uh, displace the initial point cloud? After training the model. Okay. Do you mean if we take the final splat and move something? For example, if I take a splat of this uh, table and would move uh, some splats uh, of this. Um, it actually works. Uh, there is um, this website called Play Canvas and they have an editor called uh, Super Splat. And I think one or two weeks ago they added this feature. You can just uh, with a circle select, uh, select the um, splats and move them to another side of the table or whatever. But uh, it will leave a hole because you've cut it from there. But yes, it works. Okay, thanks for visiting our presentation. Thank you.